communication in the time in the time of uh, of the crisis to Sean Patrick Labatt. For those who don't know him, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that everyone knows you, but uh, for the introduction, and uh, Sean Patrick Lovett is the expert and a doctor in communication. Uh, Professor Lovett holds a doctorate in communication from American University in Rome. In early uh, 80s, he was a television news war uh, correspondent and primarily in the Middle, Middle, Middle East. He also uh, worked as an English department director of Vatican Radio over the past 40 years. Uh, and he served for five popes. Uh, Pope Benedict award him a, a papal knighthood in uh, 2007. And for more than 30 years, Lovett has also served as a professor of media and management at the Pontifical, uh, Pontifical uh, Gregorian University in Rome, and also including the Michigan State University, University of Minnesota, and University of Southern California. Um, and he's a very good friend of uh, all the students, especially of the students of journalism and communication here in U uh, Ukraine Catholic University as, uh, in, uh, as an institute also. And I have a great pleasure to give you this possibility to share with us some of your ideas uh, about communication and about the, the period that everyone, really everyone, not only Ukrainian, uh, lived in. So please. For the invitation and I must also thank Rome Reports because if you see this beautiful studio around me uh, with, with lights and sound I have two of my colleagues uh, Arturo and Cesar who are here in the studio all to assist us our CEO Antonio Olivier who is connected with us uh, was delighted when I asked if I could use the studio today because we want the very best for you and, and for us and for our CEO, Antonio, and, and, and our colleagues, uh, this is a very small gesture. It's, it's a small gift that we can give to, to our friends in Ukraine to show you that we, we are with you and, and we support you. So you have asked me to make a, a brief presentation, and then I believe you will be asking some questions afterwards. And so my presentation begins, yes, with the... <laughs> with the flag you see, you see behind me. In fact, it was, it was last Saturday, it was last Saturday morning, um, I was in France for a series of meetings with CREC International. CREC International is the organization that sponsored my very first visit to Ukraine nearly, I think nearly 10 years ago. Uh, I was there in France and I opened an email and saw the name Andriy Shestak of the Ukrainian Catholic University, where, yes, I've been teaching for many years. Um, I confess that um, I think and I pray for my students, my colleagues, and all my friends in Ukraine every single day. So at first, I was delighted to hear from Andrei. That is until I, I read his request. He was asking me to address an online audience, that's you, on the theme of constructive communication, how to speak positively in times of crisis. My first reaction was, I can't do this. I won't do this. What can I possibly say about constructive communication at a time like this? I will have to say no. Please understand that I've addressed in my career many different audiences about many different things, but I have never spoken to people while their cities are being bombed, while their homes are being destroyed, while their children are dying, while they're burying their loved ones in graves in their backyards, even as I speak. So I wrote back to Andre and I expressed these doubts and confusions and I even dared to remind him, as if he didn't already know, that what is happening in Ukraine right now is so much more than a crisis. And then to speak about constructive communication in the midst of so much destruction seemed absurd to me. 
I said I was, and I still am, afraid of insulting any of you who are listening. And if Andre had not responded to my message right away, we would probably not be here having this conversation at all, but he did. And this is what he wrote. Dear Sean, I'm totally aware we are in the middle of a war. The terrible aggression and all the death that is happening in our country cannot be communicated in a positive way. At the same time, we're trying to support each other and to think about the future, about will what will happen when the war is over when we will have to confront many new challenges, a broken economy, a broken education system, broken relationships on so many different levels. We will need journalists and communicators who will create constructive stories and messages so we can stay positive even in the worst of times. I know I'm asking for answers that no one can give, but your students need your support. Andre. How can I ever refuse to support my students? After I read Andre's message, I went to my computer and I watched a video we made in Lviv back in 2015. 2015, yes, the year after Maidan, the revolution of dignity, when the spirit of Ukrainian identity was stronger than ever. So strong that I remember inviting my students at Uku to tell me how they saw their country, and as future journalists, how they wanted to communicate Ukraine. This is what they told me. My Ukraine is a peaceful country. Ukraine isn't Russia. Ukrainians aren't Russian. My Ukraine is still in central Crimea. My Ukraine is with Donbass and with Crimea. My Ukraine is ancient European country. Don't forget about this. My Ukraine is a beautiful country with great development. I believe it. My Ukraine is a country that has a lot of problems. My Ukraine is a country that has a lot of problems. My Ukraine is a Soviet country. My Ukraine is a marvelous country. My Ukraine is a country of creative people who want to take care about their future. When I watch this video again, seven years later, and knowing what we know now, it made me cry. It still does. So how could I possibly say no? Here I am, but before I begin, I ask you please to forgive me if what I am about to say sounds ridiculously simplistic. Please know that the only reason I am here is because I love you and I support you. So let's begin. Right, before I'm anything else, all those things that Andre told you, I'm a biological father and an anthropological teacher. I love my children and I love my students, more than words can say. And like any teacher, when I do have to make a presentation, I often go back over notes that I made for previous presentations, not to copy them, but hopefully to get some inspiration. And that's exactly what I did. I found part of a presentation that I gave to journalism students at Uku several years ago about how to communicate an emergency, a, a problem, a, a crisis. I could never have imagined that one day I'd be applying the same paradigm to a war. As we teachers often do, I simplified the approach, maybe too much, so that it fit into a comfortable ABC. Now, not for a moment do I believe that the horrors being experienced in Ukraine right now fall into any of those categories, which I described as an emergency, a problem, or a crisis. War is not a crisis. War is a catastrophe. War is a disaster of indescribable dimensions, evil in its most visible and hideous manifestation. So kindly accept my ABC for what it is, a humble and imperfect attempt to offer some clues to providing communication that is constructive when everything around you speaks of being destructive. A is for acknowledging, recognizing the situation 
for what it is and calling it by its name. What's happening in Ukraine is not a conflict, it's a war. It's certainly not a special military operation. It's a deliberate attempt to destroy a democracy of 42 million people. Targeting a theater, sheltering innocent civilians is not a military attack, it's a war crime. Murder and mass persecution is not collateral damage, it's a crime against humanity. And that's not just my personal opinion. It's codified in international law. A is also for analyzing, trying to understand the causes in order to prepare for the effects, listening intelligently and avoiding absurd simplifications like claiming it's all the fault of NATO. It's not trusting everything you read on social media. It's constantly being on the lookout for disinformation, propaganda, and the evil that lurks behind fake news. B stands for breathe deeply. Breathing deeply is a way to avoid overwhelming emotional responses. Like when people ask you stupid questions, like why doesn't Ukraine just give up and give in to Putin's demands? In other words, controlling your breathing can save you from hyperventilation and prevent a panic attack. It can also help you when you have to deal with people who say ignorant or, or stupid things about Ukraine, like what a poor and underdeveloped country it is. Obviously, they've never visited the live business school where I personally have met a young man who made himself a millionaire at the age of 22. Ignorance is simply not knowing. So you can at least try to explain. Stupidity is not knowing you don't know. So don't waste your time. Stopping to breathe deeply allows you to pause, to think, to keep a clear mind so that you can recognize the risks and act accordingly. C. C means concentrating on the cure. It's an invitation to focus on the solutions without being blinded by the problems, not to be discouraged by the failures of diplomacy or the duplicity of politicians, to look beyond the present moment, just as Andre has asked me to do. However challenging this moment may be, and to recognize this moment will pass, it always does. Anyone who survived a war will tell you how in the midst of it, they believed the world had ended and that nothing would ever be the same. And yet human resilience is such that somehow we do get through and we do have to start thinking ahead. We do need to plan for the challenges we will have to face afterwards. There will be an afterwards. There will come a time to ask, what now? Yes, I know. At this moment, some of you may be thinking, who does he think he is? This journalist in his, in his fancy studio in Rome, preaching to us about war is, what war is and what it isn't? And you're correct. I, Sean Patrick, am not living through what you are living through right now. But I have seen war close up. I was in my 20s when I worked as a war correspondent. I reported on the barbarity of the civil war in Lebanon. I recorded the cruelty of several wars in Africa. And I've never forgotten, how could I? What I learned from those experiences is that all wars end, sooner or later they do, and someone is left to pick up the pieces. So don't go away, stay with me, just a few more minutes, because this is the part where I answer Andre's question and where we get to talk about why we're here, where we get to start imagining what some positive messages might contribute to that future moment when we get there and when we will be called to reconstruct that which others have chosen to destroy. I have to say that in preparing this presentation, Google wasn't any help at all. Uh, the best it could do uh, in terms of offering me an image to illustrate constructive communication was this image of a wall, which I don't think is particularly useful to you. 
to me, constructive communication means weaving together different threads that contribute to giving us the hope and courage and strength that we need to face the challenges that we are living through now and that await us in the not too distant future. As communicators and journalists, we rely on words to act as symbols, to give us clues to what it is we're trying to say. So here are some positive words that I hope might be useful. They're not meant to replace the images of desperation and disaster that populate our news feeds at this time, but to complement and to counterbalance them in, in some way. Here they are. First word, awareness. Right now, Ukraine is the center of the world. Until last month, several of my foreign students didn't even know Ukraine was in Europe. Okay, so this map is, is for any of you who may be watching right now and, and are still not sure where Ukraine is. The, the Ukrainian flag right now is everywhere. People are, are showing it on their balconies from their homes. The Colosseum in Rome is, is lit up in the Ukrainian colors. On the city's underground metro network, th there are huge posters depicting a blue sky over a field of wheat. Who knew that the significance behind the blue and yellow colors of the flag knew that the blue represents more than just the peaceful symbolism of the sky above us, but the curiosity, the vision, and the desire of the Ukrainian people to rise above, to go beyond, to search, to discover. Until now, did anyone outside Ukraine realize that the colors of the flag represent the character of the nation's people? Heads held proudly skyward, feet planted firmly on the earth, in the fields where they work to produce grain that until now has fed most of Europe and way beyond. Here's the second word. Yeah, it's kindness. How many people across the globe have been stirred to react to the war in Ukraine with acts of pure and disinterested kindness? My eldest son, Damien, came to me once to Lviv. He, he lives in London now, and he's been volunteering there. He tells me that collection centers in London have been so overwhelmed with donations they're having to work 24 hour shifts in order to be able to distribute it. Compassion is close to kindness, but not quite. It's a word that comes from Latin and it means literally to suffer with. Cum passio, I feel what you feel. When you experience compassion, it's impossible to turn away and, and pretend like nothing is happening or that other people's suffering doesn't concern you. Generosity is the fruit of kindness and compassion. It's that inner instinct that reminds us we cannot just stand by and watch, that we must get involved, that we must give what we can materially, and why not even spiritually? Solidarity is what we're seeing in the demonstrations that are taking place across the world. As more and more people come to realize, we really are all connected. And as this poster, where is it? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, there we go. This poster I photographed myself outside a theater in Rome this week proclaims, this theater in Rome is also the theater of Mariupol. I hesitated before adding this next word, prayer. And then I thought of all the masses and the prayer vigils and the religious celebrations that are being held, of all the candles that are being lit in all the churches and synagogues and temples and places of worship around the world at this moment. For those of us who believe and have faith, prayer is a powerful weapon. Pope Francis called for a, a special day of prayer and fasting for peace on March the 2nd on Ash Wednesday here in Rome. And last Friday, 
he led a solemn and symbolic ceremony in St. Peter's Basilica, during which he consecrated both Ukraine and Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. During that ceremony, the Pope himself made it clear that these gestures are pious and powerful gestures. They're not some kind of hocus pocus. Listen to what the Pope himself said. di una formula magica no non è questo ma si tratta di un atto spirituale il gesto del pieno affidamento dei figli che nella tribolazione di questa guerra crudele e questa guerra insensata che minaccia il mondo ricorrono alla madre come i bambini quando sono spaventati vanno dalla mamma a piangere If we do have faith, then we can believe in miracles. Miracles do happen. I know of at least one. It happened a few days ago to a former student of mine from Uku. There are some students who over time become more like your, like your surrogate children, and Oleksii is one of them. Here he is with me at the Vatican Radio, where he interned some years ago. I have his permission to tell you this story because it is his story. Alexei's mother was a nurse in Mariupol when the pediatric hospital there was bombed by the Russians. He and I spoke on the phone afterwards, and he sobbed as he told me he had no way of knowing whether his mother and his grandmother, who are his only relatives, were alive or dead. And then out of the blue a few days ago, I received this message from him. My dear Sean, God has heard your prayers. A miracle has happened, and my family has escaped Mariupol. When no one would enter the area because of the heavy fighting in the streets, a group of church volunteers found my mother and granny sitting by a fire and agreed to get them out. They're safe now and on their way to Poland. I cannot call it anything else but a miracle. The trauma they have lived through will never go away, but I'm grateful to God for giving them the strength to survive. I will do everything in my power to guarantee a life for them where there is no more war and no more pain. I have three last words for you that for me sum up our task and our vocation as positive journalists and as constructive communicators, using our skills and talents to provide messages that speak of hope. Hope that all will be well and that evil will be defeated and that good will triumph and that peace will be restored. Courage to face the trials of the present moment with resilience and perseverance, never to give up, and strength. The strength to start again when the war is over, to rebuild the homes and the hospitals and the schools, to reunite the families that have been dispersed, to comfort and console those who've lost everything. So I had just finished writing the last line and I haven't even put down my mouse when my phone pinged. It was a message from, from another friend of mine at Uku, Sofia, Sofia Patska. Thank goodness she wasn't asking me to do another presentation, I don't think I would have the courage or the strength to do that. She was simply updating me on all the incredible and inspiring and positive things that the Ukrainian Catholic University has been doing over the past month and is doing. From running a volunteer center that provides humanitarian aid and assists refugees, to countering Russian propaganda, to providing spiritual and psychological support to those in need, all of this while continuing to run online distance learning programs for their students. If you're not from UKU and you haven't already some done so, I strongly suggest you visit their website and see and find out for yourself, uku.edu.ua. What they're doing, what you are doing is prophetic. You're an example to all of us. 
and I am so honored to be part of the extraordinary family of the Ukrainian Catholic University. God bless you, God bless Ukraine. Jacqueline. Over to you, Andre. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for your speech, I think. Like, uh, for me, the, the most powerful probably was, yeah, sure, a prayer, but also like to, uh, to stay tuned, to, to be like in, in, in good mood. And, and we are talking especially about, about this thing now. And I, I divide the question that we uh, received before uh, in like two topics, the question of the war and also the professional questions uh, to you as a journalist and communicator. So we will begin with the question of the war. Um, what do you think will be uh, uh, the quality of communication in Ukraine after the victory, especially like we, we for the type of the communication uh, in Ukraine now, like it developed in, in less like 30, uh, 30 days. And what do you think this, like this mainstream of the type of communication of good, uh, an example of good communication could be developed and maybe in, in what way? Of the journalism school at, at UKU, as, as I said in my presentation, goes back 10 years. And so I'm not just thinking of how it is developing now, I'm thinking of how I have seen it develop over the past 10 years. And I've seen an incredible sense of responsibility uh, and awareness on the part of the students. Uh, I, I'm very proud that some of our <laughs> students are today working in prestigious communications and media outlets at Voice of America in the United States and, and in, so many, in so many other places, uh, online media, television, radio, print, et cetera. So I, I have seen a development in terms, in terms of communication. And I know that our students will carry this forward. It, nothing just, it's not a page to learn. It's not that uh, th there's the period before the war, during the war and after the war. Everything we are and everything we will be comes from where, where we have been in, in the past. So I don't think there will be a sudden uh, uh, kind of constructive, positive messaging. I think it's, it's already there. And, and in the messages I receive from the university, like Sofia Opatska's message of, of yesterday, there's already the positive messaging. Uh, there are already paused the pictures of people doing all the things that I was talking about with those words, the expressions of kindness and compassion and solidarity and generosity, it, it's all there already. Thank you. And one message from, from the chat and Taras Zubanski is asking, in your opinion, what could be the role of religion, especially Christianity in mitigating the war in Ukraine? I purposely chose those two, those two videos. Huh? I, I hope, I'm sure you, you, you felt with me that, that they, they expressed two important aspects for me. One is my students, our students, in whom I have so much hope and so much trust for their strength and their courage and their skills and their talents uh, on the ground <laughs> and in the heavens. <laughs> Um, yes, we, we believe in the power of prayer. You, you saw, I showed you the pictures, the thanks again to, to Rome reports for that sequence of the Pope uh, consecrating Ukraine and Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But you've seen and you've heard how many times in every public opportunity from the balcony, from the window in St. Peter's Square, in public, and I know also in private, because remember that we only know what the media tells us, but there's a lot the media doesn't tell us. That the Pope is calling for prayers, not only from Catholics, but from the entire Christian community. 
and, and I know he's joined in, in that sense from many of our, our brothers and sisters in the different, in the different Christian communities. Um, churches are living, physical, concrete, material reminders that God exists. Our churches are there as safe places, not just holy places, but safe places as symbols and signs of that hope and that courage and that strength that I was speaking about earlier. And our churches and our belief systems, especially Christianity, teaches us that we must look ahead, we must look forward, we must believe that, that good will prevail, <laughs> that, that, that evil cannot resist against the power of good, and that we need to have faith in those miracles those miracles will happen. That is the message of the church, and that is the message that we continue to give in the face of the horror and the pain and the suffering. Thank you. And uh, like in in last more than months, and uh, the topic of the war uh, in Ukraine uh, was on the first first pages of every internet. Uh, or uh, any any journal and everything and um, like the question is how to properly continue the information campaign in ukraine about the war and uh, if the interest will be lost how to uh, to like return the focus of the west uh, into uh, into the topic of the war you are a media expert, Father Andre. You, you know as well as I do that media is fickle yeah. and that we, we, we lose our, our attention and our concentration very quickly. So in a sense, in terms of media attention, this is a privileged time. Um, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't joking at the beginning of my presentation when I said that I have several foreign students who did not know until a month ago where Ukraine was on the map or whether it was part of Europe. Now, suddenly, Ukraine is the center of the world and people are looking at Ukrainians, at, at your courage and your resilience, and people, have, they, they cannot, that this country is standing up to the Russian bear and, and facing the, the attacks and, and, and the unity. So, Italy likes talk shows. We have lots of talk shows on our, on our TV programs. And, and every night you will, someone will stand up on a talk show and say, what would happen if Russia attacked Italy? How would, how would Italy react? And I know that it's not just Italy. Many countries around the world, the same questions are being asked. How would Britain attack and react if Russia attacked Britain and France and Spain and Germany? And, and the, the answer is we're not sure that we would respond quite the way you are responding with the same courage and resilience. So you're a, you're a role model in a sense. Uh, and and I, I think, I hope that will remain. When the time comes for reconstruction and the time will come and there will be a lot of reconstructing to do and not just mere material reconstruction but psychological and emotional and personal. Um, then, yes, you will need the skills of our student journalists to be able to tell those stories. The sad stories, the tragic stories, and the happy stories, they go side by side. They are not mutually exclusive. For every tragic story, there is, there is a story of a miracle. There is the story of a happy ending, like the story of Alexei. Thank you, and, and, and I also I also want to add that uh, I'm I'm following all uh, all the Italian uh, publication and and is this like information influence, and I can, I can assume that uh, Italy is using a lot of empathy and uh, and emotions, and now is very like good time to enter, and I'm like all of the professor at the university is entering in different uh, environment, I can say, not only academical, but uh, political environment, economical, and so on, to, to do 
to give also more senses, like not only the emotion that we have here, like the, the all numerous dead people, the, the, the towns that uh, really ripped out uh, from, 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 from the end to the beginning, and but also the sense what is going on here and what does it mean to be like Ukrainian in this period. So yeah, like probably the next step will be give more senses, not only uh, the, the feelings. And about the question, uh, where uh, and like how one more to, thing. Oh, uh, remain. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just, sure, just one, one more thing. It's it's also a privileged opportunity, a privileged time, to overturn the stereotypes. So we we all live with stereotypes, right? Uh, I am Irish, and so you think that I like green is my favorite color, and I drink a lot of Guinness. And, and, and it's not true, actually. Blue is my favorite color, and wine I prefer to, to beer. Um, the, the, we, we think in terms of stereotypes. It was, it was in church that I said in my presentation about people thinking Ukraine is a poor country. It was a priest during the sermon who was asking for contributions to Ukraine, who said, because you know... The Ukrainians are these poor women who come to Italy to help old people. We call them badanti. And, and they come, you know, because Ukraine is such a poor country. They have nothing to eat. They are so poor. And I, I had to go to him after the mass and say, Father, um, have you been, do you know any, do you really know anything about Ukraine? Um, and and, and talk to, I talked to him about the Lviv Business School and, and how, how your entrepreneurs how, how brilliant and creative they are, and what an extraordinary um, country yours is. So this is an opportunity also huh, to, to inform people and to instruct people and to overturn a lot of the ignorance that there is about Ukraine. Sorry, that was it, your next question. Um, yeah, this question is more about the probably the psychology and uh, were to take a long-term force to be positive in, in the time of the crisis. Okay, so um, <laughs> I was, no, no, this, I, I will not lie to you. I'm an Irish Catholic. I'm not allowed to lie. So um, I was at the Gregorian, Pontifical Gregorian University this morning, where I still teach a communications course. And I met one of my, she's a student at the Gregorian University, but she is also from Lviv. And I told her that I was doing this, I would have this conversation with you this afternoon. And I told her what the topic was. And she rolled her eyes to the ceiling and she said, say no, you can't do that. It is hypocrisy to speak about constructive communication or positive messaging in the middle of a war when people are dying and people are crying. And I said, I've already said yes. And she said, well, good luck, because whatever you're going to say, people are going to hate you. Um, I, I hope you don't hate me. I, I really am doing, doing the best I can, but I agree with, it was a huge, it took me everything that I said to be able to say yes. Uh, I don't think we can, we can put our heads in, in, you know, above the clouds and say, just look at, uh, forward to a brighter, a brighter future. We, we need to address the issue in the now. We need to acknowledge, that was my first word. We need to acknowledge what is happening, the pain and the suffering and the destruction, and together at the same time, think about what we will be saying when things get better. So I admire your courage in having this conversation this afternoon, um, but I don't want to go too far with this idea of, of being positive because too many bad things are happening right now. 
Yes, Thank I you. am avoiding and, and, the question. Uh, yes, I am avoiding the question. I, I, I admit. <laughs> yes. Um, and also the, the question from um, Donelo Vavrio. Uh, how long do you think the attention to Ukraine uh, how will remain and what can interrupt this attention? How long will it remain in terms of time? Yes. I, I have no, yes. we, we, we have no idea. I, I have no crystal ball. Uh, we, we are hoping mm -hmm. that the war ends and that it ends soon and that peace will return and we can think about reconstruction in all the ways we have, we have spoken about. Um, a yardstick, a way to gauge that time frame you're asking me about is simply to look at what has happened in previous circumstances and previous wars. Uh, I think of the wars that I have covered as a war correspondent. There was a terrible civil war that took place in Lebanon that lasted for years and left horror and destruction and pain and suffering in its wake. It was in the early 1980s, it was 40 years ago. If I were to ask some of my foreign students today, where is Lebanon? I wonder how many could put their fingers on the map. So it's difficult to put a time stamp on how long the attention will stay. It will definitely stay for some time after the war because we will need to concentrate on reconstruction and we will be able to count on that kindness and generosity and compassion uh, that, that we are counting on already. And, and then I another war will break out somewhere else and bad things will happen somewhere else and our attention will go there because that is the way our media works. It's sad, but true. Thank you. And the, the question from the professional side, <clears throat> how, how could be written the, the story positively, uh, especially um, if the most stories uh, in Ukraine are very scary and the rape girls or women, the deaths, and uh, really, where is the border um, for the journalist to deliver some this kind of the story? What maybe what are the, the regulars that he could be like uh, having during, during creating uh, this type of the stories? It's a question that I get asked <laughs> during every single journalism class from every single journalism student when we talk about war or being a war correspondent. The temptation is always to move towards sensationalism, isn't it? Because sensation draws its clickbait on, on social media, it draws attention. A woman crying on screen will draw attention, but only for a while because there's always the danger, is there not, that we will become immune to the bad things that we see and we hear. And that is the danger, that too much pain and too much blood and too many tears, in the end, we do just turn away because it's something that we have seen already. And so every journalist, it's like, it's a little like cooking, isn't it? Uh, it's knowing how much salt and how much put pepper and how much pepperoncino to put in the meal. Enough to keep it tasty, but not so much that it burns your mouth and you have no taste left at all. It's all about, it's about balance. It's constantly about balance. And also, um, how to build a positive red strat in the story? What is your experience of uh, experience of building some this kind of stories that could be uh, could be like connected together? We are journalists. We work in media. We're communicators, and so we understand what the rules of communication are and what it is that attracts 
people. I can prepare a beautiful story for television, for radio, for, for print, for online consumption. But if it does not attract attention, uh, my efforts are, are worthless. So to know that, for example, we are attracted by heroes. The world needs heroes. Your president right now, Zelensky, is, is a hero. And, and he knows how to use media. He, he is a brilliant uh, and a true expert in using media, not too much, not too little. He balances where he is, how he dresses, what the backgrounds are. Personally, I'm very struck when he addresses members of parliament in different countries and he gets a standing ovation he doesn't stand there on screen and bow and acknowledge and wave to the crowd. He gets up and he leaves the room because the applause is not for him. It's a brilliant use of how to balance, how to understand the medium and what is attractive to the medium and to use those rules of media to get your positive message across. So if you're looking for an example, you don't need to look any further than your, than your president right now. Thank you. And um, I want to, uh, to say that we have like 10, 15 minutes more with Sean Patrick Lavette. If someone have a question, please send it to, to our chat. And um, I have two more. And um, the, the, the question, how to write and speak effectively in, uh, in the crisis situation. Not only this question is not only about the war, but like in, in every crisis, what, what could be on the base of this type of communication? Is talk about that fake news is, is the, big, you know, the big words. And we talk about telling the truth and what is truth and how do we tell the truth and how do we fight propaganda and so on and so forth. We, we, we study that, we know that, we work, we work on that. There are algorithms that can help us and so on and so forth. But to answer directly your question, I, I think there are, two, there are two criteria. The one is to ask when you are writing, when you are putting together a story in a crisis, you finish writing the story and you ask, is this useful? Is this helpful? Does it tell people something that they need to know? Not that they want to know, because they can find out what they want to know from all sorts of sources. Is this something that they need to know? Is this something that is going to, that is going to build them up, that is going to extend their awareness, that is going to help them to understand the situation better? Is this, is this useful? Does it, does it bring people together to a greater understanding? And is it good? Does it advance goodness? We have a choice. Huh? We can communicate goodness or, or evil, badness. Huh? Does it only focus on the bad things, the terrible things, the evil that is happening? Or does it show people the heroism and the kindness and the compassion and the solidarity and the generosity that is inside people and maybe inspire, inspire, that's another word too to be inspirational, to bring people out of themselves. Pope Francis speaks about this all the time. He speaks about the need not to concentrate on what is inside, to be turned in on ourselves, but whatever, whatever messages, whatever communication can bring us out of ourselves and make us aware that we are connected and that your pain is my pain, your suffering is my suffering. That is compassion. Probably your answer goes not only for the effective communication in the period of the crisis, but um, for the meaning, meaning of everything, like to be, to be useful for someone and give the inspiration. And at least it's a, a good two words for the meaning of the life, I think so. And as, as the, the last question, uh, what do you think? is the most important thing in communication and what kind of questions or arg uh, arguments 
is the are the better uh, to use during uh, during the period of the crisis? Hey, Andre, I, I have to say that that before coming to do this um, this uh, conversation with you this afternoon, I, I I had butterflies in my tummy. And I still <laughs> I still have butterflies in my tummy because I feel a little bit like I'm a student back at university and and I'm being examined. <laughs> On, on a, for something I haven't studied very well. I haven't read the book that I was supposed to study for this, for this exam. You ask me very difficult questions. I'm very happy I'm not your student. Huh? Your questions are, <laughs> are, really, are really tough. Um, so yes, uh, just, just say the, 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 what was the basis of the question again? Oh, oh yes, what um, I consider yes. to be the most important points for communication. What do I consider? Yeah. Sean Patrick, what yes. do you consider the most important points? Right. Um, honesty. Honesty. Uh, uh, that honesty brings in its truthfulness and sincerity and, and authenticity. I think authenticity is, is a strong word. Um, Authenticity is, is yes, it's, it's another form of honesty and sincerity, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's not playing games. It's, it's, not, it's not pretending to be something that you're not or to say something that you don't really believe. That's authenticity. Because that gives us credibility. That's why we believe each other, don't we? And, and in the end, if I am writing or, or producing messages and communicating messages. What I need is for you to believe me. And if you feel for a moment by what I'm saying or how I'm saying it, that I'm insincere, that I don't really believe what I'm saying, that I'm putting on a performance, an act, and it's not authentic, it's not real, then you will already switch off and go somewhere else. So yes, the content is important. The content, we try to make it useful. We try to, 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 to bring significance and meaning to our content, but at the same time, the way in which we present it in terms of communication, yes, I think honesty, sincerity, authenticity is the key. Be and say what and who you are. Thank you. Yeah, we been in the school like built some kind of formula as as you use like A B C. Uh, we use that everything have to be built on on the base of the values. Only with the values you could like um, create a message, and then like this two uh, two consist consistent thing could be it could go to the content. So it's like the, the effect of communication for us, at least, it's something that is go from the values to the message and uh, to the type, uh, different types of the content. So thank you. And really, we, we are very grateful, uh, grateful for you uh, for, for an amazing lecture and for your time. And uh, we have a lot of messages to you in this in this period, first of all, the, the, the uh, thank you for your support, and uh, yeah, and we have also one question from the Stas Korolkov. So please, Stas, for, before the concluding. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to give uh, a very short note that my colleague Anna Deviat is also. Uh, gave a question in the chat that's mm -hmm. uh, well well I should say much more interesting than my question but still uh, so dear Sean, uh, th um, thank you so much for your lecture I have the question concerning uh, the the uh, the disputes that are now taking place in Ukraine at least in social media about the uh, amount of presence of Russian culture in Ukraine after after the war uh, well, undoubtedly that all the attention of Ukrainians is now fully concentrated on, on war, but still uh, there are some thoughts that after our victory, we should take out all the elements of Russian culture from Ukrainian education. Uh, um, well, for instance, I've heard that 
poems and uh, like novels of Russian uh, po po poets and writers uh, date, dating back to 18th or 19th century. They, they also should be taken out on, from the school program of education. Some people think that this is too much, that those guys who died like 200 years ago had nothing to do with this war. But still, I'm, I want to ask you, uh, could you please help us to draw this threshold, crossing, you know, crossing this threshold that people would say that, no, guys, that is too much. So thank you. I've even heard people go further than that. I have been hearing people saying that the Russian language should be banned in Ukraine and that people who speak Russian in Ukraine, and there are many Russian speaking Ukrainians, should be forced to speak only Ukrainian. So yes, there is, there is that response. But that's an emotional response, isn't it? And, and we, we, we recognize that as a, we would say, a gut, it's a gut response, a, a knee jerk response, an emotional reaction to what is happening. There is an enemy in my house. I want the enemy out of my house. And when the enemy leaves my house, I want the enemy to take everything with him. All the furniture and everything must go. They must clean out, clean out my house. But, but that is an emotional reaction. And, and that was my B suggestion, which is that we have to stop and breathe. Uh, and sometimes the breathing just means to let some time go by. So the discussion will take place and it is taking place and it will continue to take place. Let some time go by and, and, and let the breath, let the breath, let it, let it go. Um, of course, it's not the solution. You know it's not. I know it's not. It's a silly solution. Cancel culture, any kind of cancel culture anywhere is not useful. You don't tear the statue down. You put up a plaque underneath the statue that explains why the statue was put up and why the statue is inappropriate today, that there is a lesson to be learned from history. We do not cancel history and the people that have come with it. We explain what happened and we try to teach as educators the lessons that we learn from history. Thank you. So if, Thank you so much. Um, I want to, to, to ask for the permission. We have two more questions, and probably and those could be the, the last one. Do we have like more time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. This one it will be like the, the question with uh, with the cross. Uh, so um from Anna Deviatko. Following uh, some weeks ago, a well-known Russian propagandist of Sianikova went on the screen of one Russian TV channel with a banner calling to stop Russian aggression. First of all, they say there is no on-air news on Russian TV to minimize the risk and all other reasons, seconds uh, of all during eight years of Sianikova has been spreading hard propaganda and she decided to wake up only now. Besides, uh, on your professional experience, on the base of your professional experience, what do you think was a real intention of this action? And how do you evaluate it, especially taking into account her current narratives she is spreading in the Western media asking to cancel sanctions? So yeah, it's, it, it's the question with, with the cross, you know. It, you will uh, you will give the the highest mark. Of course, I follow. Yes, I followed the story, and 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 yes. I I saw the reaction on on both sides. So here she is. She's defending Ukraine. She is daring to do this. She's a hero on the other side. She is discredited. She she is working. She is part of the Russian propaganda machine. Um, so in the. <laughs> In the Catholic tradition, we, we do not judge people. <laughs> we, we give them what we call the benefit of the doubt. I do not know what is happening inside her head. Uh, I, I do not know her personally. I do not know her motives. What I do know is that the gesture did 
provoke a lot of reaction and got a lot of talk people talking about Russian propaganda. So here again, there is a potentially negative story that has a potentially positive twist to it. For several days, I saw and I read a lot of journalists talking about how the Russians use propaganda and how they twist things around. So in the end, whether it was a good story or a bad story, whether she's sincere or not sincere, what I care about is that a new message came through. Look out, do not believe everything you see, do not take things simply at face value. And that was a lesson that we learned. So thank you to her, whatever her reasons. And today, the, the largest TV channels in Ukraine have joined forces to broadcast the situation live, like online. And uh, like on... Andrei. What was, what was yes. my score on that? What mark, what grade did I get? Yeah. Depends on, 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 on the test gradation type. And you're going to be my all right. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to give the to give you the highest mark. You know, you you are uh, answering the question more than forty minutes, so it could be a uh, well, it had to be like evaluate. So the the last one for today, um, the um, like all the largest TV channels uh, are transmitting and broadcasting the situation live, especially here in Ukraine, every channel, uh, like private or uh, government channels are um, speaking about the war. And like after, um, at least Yulia Rizanchok is feeling this, uh, after this more than 30, 30 days of the war, it for someone, it, it transformed into something kind of entertainment. So how could we avoid that? Is that risk isn't there uh, that but that and we, we spoke about that earlier over overexposure uh, and and that certainly younger people uh, who play with PlayStation and so forth can confuse what they're seeing in reality on their TV with what they're playing on their on their PlayStation that that is that is a danger um, how, how to combat that is, it's always about balance, isn't it? I believe that is why God gave us two hands uh, and, not, and not just one, uh, to remind us that balance is so important. And so on the one hand, as journalists and communicators, we have a duty and a responsibility to communicate the reality of what is happening. On the other hand, we have the duty and the responsibility to explain why it is happening and that there are other stories that are worth telling as well. Balance, harmony, authenticity. Thank you. And I have to return to my thanks notes. And um, I have to say that normally I'm not giving for the students the, the 100. Uh, the, the, the maximum of, of the marks. Uh, but I have to say that probably you, you did a very good job today. So thank you very much for, uh, for your time. And thank you very much for, uh, for, your, for your help, for your support, for amazing and, and very inspired lesson. We are very grateful uh, for your answers. And God bless you. And also, maybe if you want to add something for all of the students of the School of, of Journalism and Communication and also for the Institute of Leadership, um, this is the right time. Andre, thank you. I think I've said everything I, I had to say in, in the first part of my presentation. Uh, I said how much I support you, how much I love you, how much I think about you and pray for you every day. And, and what, what an honor it has been to be able to engage with you today. There, there's not much more, much more to say. Uh, I do want to thank Rome Reports uh, for their generosity and, and my, my director, uh, Antonio Olivier, and my colleagues, Cesar Espos and, and, and Arturo, who are here with me 
in the studio and have made this professionally possible. I didn't want to do this from home, uh, sitting in my, in my armchair in, in my home. I, I wanted to be able to do it with PowerPoints and with, with videos to show you that you are important and that we do care about you and that, and that we want to give you the best, the best that we have. And, and that is what we've tried to do this afternoon. So again, thank you, God bless you, God bless Ukraine, Jakuyu. Thank you.